But the consistent message in the Jacob story is not the goodness of Jacob, but the affection, presence, mm -hmm. and uh, unceasing devotion of God. Hello, 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 ladies and gents, and welcome to this week's episode of the Bought and Beloved podcast. My name is Kirby Kelly, as always, and I'm so glad that you are tuning into this week's episode, whether it is because you are a loyal listener, whether it is because you saw who is my amazing guest this week, or if you're just looking up um, more about the Lord and you want to know more about his heart for you, maybe you haven't known him, maybe you have a past and you just don't feel like God truly loves you. Hey, we're here to tell you today that he loves you, that he is kind, that he is always pursuing, that his mercy is for you, his love is for you. Uh, and we're going to talk about all those things with my guest today, Max Lucado. So Max, how about you just let all the listeners and the viewers know who you are, what you do, and maybe some of the things that you're passionate about. Well, hi, Kirby. Thank you so much for letting me share these moments with you. I don't take that for granted. I, I sincerely, sincerely appreciate it. It's great to meet you and to spend time with you. I thank God for your passion mm -hmm. for, for people, for his word, uh, yeah. because we desperately, desperately need it. Uh, we live in a day in which hope is truly an endangered species, and um, many people are battling depression, anxiety, mm -hmm even struggling with thoughts of suicide. And all we can do to help people stay on their feet, to not throw in the towel, is worth it. I'm a, I'm a pastor. Uh, I have uh, <laughs> was ordained long before you were born. I was ordained in 1979. Stop. That's before Noah built the ark. And uh, I've served a church in uh, Florida, Miami, Florida, then I served for many years a wow. small church in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. That's where two of my three daughters were born. Uh, yes, I do speak Portuguese, and yes, I do love the Brazilians. And then we moved to San Antonio in 1988. So I've been in San Antonio a significant amount of time. And uh, most of that time, I've served as senior pastor of the Oak Hills Church. But a few years ago, I moved into mm -hmm. a role that we call teaching pastor, uh, which mainly means or which does mean that I don't have to lead the staff anymore, not in charge of budgets or buildings. I just get to preach. Nice. And so I preach about 20 or 25 times a year. Um, I write a lot of books. Uh, we have uh, three daughters and we have uh, two grandchildren oh and we have two grandchildren on the way. So we're about to double our number of grandkids. Uh, so that, that's that's pretty much it. I love I love to play golf. I'm not very good, but I love to play golf. Uh, and I'm married to a wonderful, wonderful <laughs> woman who's got a lot more wisdom than I do. Uh, we just celebrated 42 years of marriage, uh, and I love her more than ever. Oh well, congratulations! That's incredible. What an inspiration. Thank you. Well, I do want to say before we dive into your new book, which is called God Never Gives Up on You, what Jacob's story teaches us about grace, mercy, and God's relentless love, which you can all order by the time this podcast is out. Um, I also just want to, this is, I said before we hopped on that this is really amazing for me because I know you've written so many books and one that you wrote, which is a children's book that actually ministered to me in my adulthood was Punchinello. I was telling my friends about that the other night that um, I went through this season of my own life uh, where I was in biblical counseling at school and was really struggling with identity and wondering if God truly did love me. And I think it's kind of cool you touch about that even in this book, uh, just about the relentless love of God. Um, and that book changed my life, like changed my life. And so just even being able to spend time with you today and, and have your time is a blessing. So I just want you to know that you truly, that book ministered to me and brought me a lot of healing in my life. And reading this book as well spoke to me too. Yeah, you know, that book about Punchinello, it's entitled You Are Special. That's my best-selling book ever. Isn't that interesting? It makes sense. Now, what's funny is that um, that book is in many languages. 
It's actually uh, well distributed in China. Oh, wow. Uh, mainly because it's not a, an overtly religious book. Mm -hmm. It's, as you know, an allegory. And uh, But I wrote that book in one afternoon, the whole thing. Wow. Uh, and I wrote it because I had a deadline, and I thought I had already sent a story in to the publisher, and they oh, said, no. no, you owe us written for story. Oh, my gosh. Well, my daughters were small at the time, and, we, of course, we had story time at night. And we love to make up our stories. And so I was making that one up with them. And so one afternoon, the day that story was due, mm -hmm. uh, I, I just wrote it up and, uh, and sent it to the publisher. And they included it as one of seven stories. It mm -hmm. wasn't even really highlighted. It's just one of seven stories. But it caught a lot of attention. So they turned it into a standing standalone book called Your Special. And wow. I'm very, very grateful. Um, it just shows that sometimes we have an obligation to me, and, <laughs> and God can be inspirational in an obligation as much as he can in a moment of inspiration. That's incredible. I'm glad to know the backstory behind it. Even if it was written in an afternoon, still ministered to me, and I love it just as much. Um, well, let's get into this book that you wrote, God Never Gives Up On You. And I love how you open up this book because you begin by addressing your audience, specifically those who identify with the Tilted Halo Society. And I am 100% a member of that society. And I would love for you to kind of explain who that group of people is and um, maybe even why you named it that, because I think that's such a creative name. Well, the story of Jacob um, is such an intriguing story in the Bible. Uh, in case we, in case a person needs context, Jacob is the is the grandson of Abraham, the grandson of the father Abraham. Abraham gets all the press. Uh, his son Isaac is not as well known, and then Jacob is better known, but we can't quite figure him out. He's enigmatic because uh, he seems to always Kirby be kind of working the system. Uh, he, 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 he deceives his brother. He tricks his father. Uh, he ends up marrying someone that he doesn't love while he's thinking he's marrying someone he does. Uh, he wrestles with God. He argues with God. He, he, toward the end of his life, he, his sons go ballistic on a village and kill the people. And it's just, you just when you think he's kind of moving into the role of a patriarch as a person of God, then he steps back, you know, and yep. we shake our head. But what are the, you doing? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the consistent uh, message in the Jacob story is not the goodness of Jacob, but the affection, presence, and uh, mm -hmm. unceasing devotion of God. God keeps involved in his life. He keeps honoring the covenant. And so I think that's why, you know, we opened this particular book talking to those of us, myself included, who feel like we stumble more than we stride, who struggle mm -hmm. more than we succeed. And that's okay. It's okay because this message of Jacob is that God has a place for those of us whose halos seem to be tilted. And, uh, and that place is dependent upon God's goodness, not our performance. So good. I think that's a message that so many of us need to hear, whether we are a Christian and have been walking with the Lord, but have stumbled and strayed or slipped while we've been on the narrow path he calls us to, or those of us um, who understand that we have this need for God, yet we don't feel deserving. We don't feel like we're worthy. But exactly like you said, it's not on the basis of our worth, our character, our doing that God loves us. It is simply because of who he is. And we see that again and again and again in the story of Jacob, even as uh, my husband and I have been talking about it, because he's actually reading that in, in the Bible right now, going through that story. It's, I almost feel like for, for those who are listening, who know the story of the prodigal son, reading that, it almost yep. feels like I'm the, I'm the son that's in the house that's like, 
this guy, this is who you choose to be the father of the nation of Israel. This guy, you're blessing this person who did this, 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 and this. I mean, his name, his literal name, Jacob is deceiver. Um, and I, I want to talk about, I know you mentioned in the book talking about how there's this instance where Jacob wrestles with God and he leaves this, this encounter, which wrestling with God, oh my goodness, we do that every day, I feel like. But he leaves this encounter and he has a new name. And I, I want to focus for a second just on the significance of the name that he once had and maybe the reputation and the life that came with that versus the name that he's now leaving with after this encounter with God, Israel. Are you able to maybe explain the name Jacob and maybe the life he lived and the name Israel and, and maybe what came from that encounter with God? Well, you would great thoughts, Thank you. Kirby. What great thoughts. Your, your, your parallel with Jacob and the prodigal son is spot on. Um, I came across a book, I can pull it off the shelf, uh, a, a, a Hebrew scholar who did exactly that, a, a messianic a believer in Jesus, but he, oh, wow. he paralleled the story of the prodigal son and Jacob. And I, I think there's so much, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that, that the two stories have in common. And what you're describing there, the, the wrestling match uh, between God and Jacob in the mud of Jabbok, Jabbok, mm -hmm. J-A-B-B-O-K, I think it's spelled. It's a river. Uh, it's a tributary of the Jordan River. And uh, in terms of context, if I can take just a minute, yeah, um, Jacob betrays his family, goes into hiding because Esau wants to kill him. Esau, remember, was his brother. He escapes and is in the uh, household of his uncle Laban who yeah. turns out to be more of a deceiver even than Jacob. And I will talk about that name. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great story. Oh, my goodness. But that's 20 years. And over those 20 years, he he has two wives, which was a mistake. I mean, he marries one that he didn't want to marry because Laban is tricky, ends up having to work more years to have Rachel, the wife he wants. And through those two wives and plus two handmaidens, which also was a mistake, he begins having kids. And those kids were at each other's throats. The women are at each other's throats. His house is not a place of peace. Laban is cheating him out of his wages. Finally, after 20 years, God says, enough is enough. It's time for you to go back to Bethel, back to where this all started. So in order for him to get back to Bethel, he has to go through the territory of Esau. By this point, Esau is kind of a landowner of sorts, a baron of sorts. Uh, he has a large number of men who report to him, soldiers, if you will, who protect his livestock and crops. So Jacob does not know whether or not he will survive this encounter with Esau. He doesn't know if Esau is going to forgive him or killing. Mm -hmm. So when he reaches the brook Jabbok, he sends his family on a cross and Jacob stays to spend the night. And that's when this wrestling match takes place. I would put it in a short list of the most mystical moments in the Bible. You get 10 people in a room discussing this moment, they're going to come up with 10 different ideas. I mean, because it's just mystical. It's just mystical. Yeah. It does seem to be he's wrestling with God because later he says, I have seen God face to face. Why God would come and wrestle with him? There's a good question, because the two are back and forth all night long, slippery bodies in the mud, in the water. It's a lot, night long wrestling match. At one point, Jacob seems to think that he has the upper hand, and he says, bless me, or I won't let you go. And then with just a touch on the hip, the stranger, or God, uh, either dislocates or injures mm -hmm the hip of Jacob. And we know that the hip is the biggest muscle in the body. And the message there is, you just think mm -hmm. you're in control. You're going to walk with a limp the rest of your life. But then God changes his name from Jacob to Israel. He does it like this. He says, what is your name? Now in scripture, immediately you read the word Jacob. Jacob answers the question. I can't help but think that there was a long pause because Jacob, as you said, means cheater or swindler, one who holds the heel, one who 
one who's, it's not a positive connotation. So I think what God is doing here, and this is my take, is he's inviting Jacob just to confess who he is. I've been working the system, God. I've been working the system for 20 years. Yeah, I should have gone home a long time ago. I should have apologized to my family, to my brother. I should have uh, made amends with everybody, but I haven't. I've been working the system. So he basically confesses who he is. And then God says, I will change your name to Israel. Israel. Israel, one of the meanings is God fights. And so some say, okay, that's because Jacob fought with God. It seems better to me to say, no, God fought for Jacob. God fought for Jacob. And so mm-hmm. God gives him a new name. So before I press the pause button on this question, let me just point out that's what happens when we become a Christian. We become Christian. I says, mm-hmm. who are you? We say, well, we're Jacobs. We're sinners. We're in need of grace. And God says, based on that confession, I'm going to give you a new name. That name is forgiven. That name is born again. That name is eternal child of mine. And he gives us a new identity. Now, Jacob, we can only hope, would have lived up to his new name. He did some. He didn't some. Just like just like yours, true. Just like me, too. And I think the story of Jacob really showcases humanity. It's like we look at these patriarchs in the Bible and we can compare ourselves and even just the women in the word as well. That's like, oh, well, they led these mighty nations and they they had this much faith and they did all these things. And we look at Jacob and I think he's kind of like the underdog or the person on the outskirts where it's like, and then there's Jacob, but his name's Israel. So he must be important. Right. Uh, I mean, father of the 12 tribes. Am I right? But what, what you said, even just showing his vulnerability in that moment, how he went from a person who cheated his way to receiving the covenant that was meant for his older brother to carry, and then went on to deceive and meet another person, Laban, who kind of challenged him in that, and they went back and forth and back and forth, and there's all this mess that happens. It's best, better than reality TV, in my opinion, all this stuff that goes on in the Bible. And he comes to this point where he just even even having not been a person of mighty faith and mighty prayer, but comes to this humble realization of who he was, and then God changes and transforms him. I think you and I, hypothetically, those of us even who are listening or watching, who are wrestling in the mud, can get stuck in that place where God is offering us this new name, this new opportunity to do life with him, to live life with him. But we have such a hard time of receiving that new name, that new calling, which at the end of the day is a display of God's grace, God's forgiveness and God's mercy. And so for the person who might be listening and tuning in today, who might be having a hard time being like, God, I know you're offering me this this new name as chosen and freed and forgiven and loved and purposed and positioned with a, a calling in mind and all these things, but they're still stuck in the mud. They're in their past and they don't feel worthy. What would you say to that person who just doesn't feel like maybe they're enough to receive all that God wants to give them freely? Yeah, I think I would say that that he who began a good work in you is faithful to bring it to completion. Mm. I mentioned earlier that my wife and I uh, just celebrated our 42nd year anniversary. Um, So on August 8, 1981, we legally and uh, spiritually became married, okay? I, I could not be more married on August 9th, 1981, than I was on August 8th. I mean, it's a done deal. Mm -hmm. But then again, in another way, I could become more married in the sense that I could understand my wife better. Mm. I could uh, be a better husband. Uh, I could respond to her needs in a more efficient way. In a sense, I have become more and more married every day to the point where now, I mean, I think like my wife, and she thinks like she can finish my sentences. Uh, It's it we're we're, we are one person increasingly. So my point is, when we when we say yes to Christ, 
uh, we could not become more saved than we were the moment we were first saved. Mm. But we can grow in the depth of that relationship. Little by little, or sometimes by leaps and bounds, depending on the season, we grow. We grow in our faith. And Jacob did. Jacob did. He grew in his faith. Uh, sometimes it seemed like it was interminably long, these periods between his growth. But he did grow. He mm -hmm. did. He had his moments, not too many of them, but he had his moments. <laughs> and, uh, and, and yet he was still, the point is, he was still Jacob. Mm -hmm. He was still Israel. God had made a covenant with Abraham. He repeated that covenant to Isaac. He repeated it to Jacob that mm -hmm. through their ancestry, all the world would be blessed. And he kept that promise. And so in the end, I think Jacob's story says that God has given you a new name. Say yes to that new name and grow into it. Grow mm -hmm. into it. And he is faithful to complete that work that he has begun. Perfectly said. Perfectly said. We don't have to be intimidated by the call. We don't have to be intimidated by who God is to enter into a relationship with him coming from where we've been, what we've done, the name we once answered to. We can step in exactly like you said and grow into the person that he has called us to be. And that's what sanctification is. Daily, day by day, we are looking more like Jesus. It's I think of the statue of David, that that masterpiece is underneath, but it just takes some chiseling to get there. And so if you're intimidated by what you've done or maybe the God that you thought was, read the word, get into a community of believers, read this book for goodness sakes, and understand the true steadfast and all encompassing forgiveness of God and what he can do in your life, just like he did in Jacob's life. But Max, is there anything you want to add as we wrap up this week's episode of the Bottom Beloved podcast? Well, I just don't want to say how thankful I am for you, how excited I am about the ministry that, that you and your husband have, have embraced. I'm very optimistic. I'm very excited about uh, what the decades hold for you both as you continue to lead people uh, in, into understanding his word. Uh, I think you and I have a lot in common. We both love the Bible, and we both love to, to put the Bible in language that everybody can understand. And, and so I applaud that ambition of yours. I think it's really, really important. And may God give you strength and faith. May he keep you from discouragement and detractors. Um, may you may you uh, stay committed to this for the long haul. And unless Christ comes first, may you enjoy a life full of ministry and wonderful harvest. Thank you, Max. Thank you for taking the time to be here and to just pour into everybody who's listening and for even just being faithful to continue on in ministry within your church, with teaching and holding that position and even in writing because... Like I said, you're a guest here on the podcast, but I read this thing and it's good. So it ministered to me truly. Um, but everybody, this book, by the time this episode is live, is available. I'll put the link in the description. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can go, you can purchase it. I encourage you to. It's amazing. Like I said, the first portion, it really dives into the life and the story of Jacob. And the latter half of it really is engaging with helping you to even ask questions within your own life as you read this story. So it's great for study. You should definitely pick it up. I loved it. Um, but with that being said, again, Max, thank you for taking the time to be here. And for all of you who are listening, thank you for taking the time to tune into this week's episode of the Bot and Beloved podcast. As always, the videos drop on Tuesdays, the audio drops on Wednesdays. So whenever you're watching this, however you're listening to it, thank you. And I'll see you guys next week. Love you. Bye.